Well, good morning, everybody. We are thrilled that you've joined us for what we certainly hope is our last online-only service. Now, I realize that there are many of you that maybe just aren't ready to come back next week or maybe because of other underlying health conditions, you need to stay home. But whether you're here in person or you're joining us online, I hope that you will plan to be a part of next week's service. We're going to launch a brand new sermon series that we think is going to be really relevant and timely for where we find ourselves right now. But this morning, as we dive in, I wonder how many of you remember this, the magic eight ball. Um, The Magic 8-Ball is a toy that actually was invented in 1950, but it continues to be sold by the Mattel Toy Company, and they sell a million of these things every year. In 2011, Time Magazine named the Magic 8-Ball one of the 100 greatest toys of all time. And and you know how it works, right? You you ask a yes or no question, you shake it up, and it, it gives you the answer. And we if we're really honest, we really wish that life kind of worked this way, don't we? We wish God worked this way, right? God, is, is this the person that I'm supposed to marry? Outlook, not so good, right? God, is this the job that I'm supposed to take? It's decidedly so, right? We wish that, that life worked like, that God worked like the magic eight ball. And we're really honest we know that life is far more complicated than that. That God is far more complicated than that. And sometimes we find ourselves disappointed that that's so. We find ourselves disappointed that, that God doesn't make his will for us more clear. God, I want to do what you want me to do. I, I want to find myself in the center of your will. But I just don't know what it is. We all know that our lives really are the accumulation of our choices. And some of us have made some choices that we now regret. Some of us lived in seasons of regret for a long time. And we don't want to go back there. God, how do I find and follow your will. We began to explore that question last week in in part one of our sermon series called TBD, Finding and Following the Will of God. And if you weren't a part last week, I'd really encourage you to go back and listen to the podcast or watch the sermon online to get caught up with where we are today. But but we find ourselves in this place where we're, we're wanting to know, God, how do we find and follow your will? And last week, we established some, some important kind of uh, laying the ground for how we get after this. We said that God's will for our lives really isn't so much like a path to be followed, but it's like a playing field with boundaries, a playing field that gives us a lot of freedom for different possibilities within the boundaries, the boundaries of God's declared will, what he tells us in scripture and his decreed will, what he's up to in the world, what he is sovereignly determined is going to happen. And within those boundaries, God gives us great freedom as we seek to do his will. We talked about the reality that God doesn't give us the plan in advance because he knows there's a likelihood that if he gave us the plan, we'd just screw it up and we'd be likely to pursue the plan and not pursue him. But his plan is for us to pursue his presence. His presence is the plan. And so we said that God doesn't want us living in, uh, in, in anxious paralysis. He, he doesn't want us living in willful defiance. He, he doesn't want us living in mindful negligence. He wants us instead living in present dependence. And in order to do that, we said we submit ourselves to God. We seek counsel from wise, godly people. And we take the next step of obedience that we know to take. But some of us last week at the end were saying, okay, that's good, that's helpful, but how do I know what the next step is? How do I know what obedience looks like? Well, that's what we're gonna explore together this morning. 
I want to encourage you, if you haven't already, to grab a pen and a notebook or maybe your notes app on your phone. I I don't have a single passage that I'm going to walk you through this morning, as is usually the case. I have a few different passages that I want us to, to give attention to. But what I want to offer you this morning are three kinds of questions that I think that we have to ask and answer if we're going to determine the next step of obedience. Three kinds of questions that we have to ask and answer in order to truly find and follow the will of God. And the first one is this. It is the motive question. In order for us to determine what obedience looks like, what that next step is for us to take, we have to ask and answer the motive question. What is my deepest, truest motive? will this honor God? Even as I find myself facing perhaps a a decision, options that I have to choose between, is there one or another of these options that will honor God more? What's my deepest and truest motive? In Colossians chapter three, verse 17, Paul says this. He says, whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. All right? In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, he says it even more succinctly. He says, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. God wants our deepest, truest motive ultimately to be for his glory. Whatever you do, Do it all for the glory of God. God's glory, as depicted throughout the Bible, is really the recognition of his character and beauty. God wants people, he wants all of us, he wants all humanity to to recognize his character and his beauty. The Hebrew word for glory is the word kabod, and literally it means weight. God's desire is for his character and beauty to be weighty in our lives for his glory to have gravity in all of our decision-making. That whatever we do, we would ultimately do it for the glory of God, for the reputation of Christ. I gotta tell you, the, the, the most consequential decision that I have faced since becoming senior pastor, and, and there have been a few of them along the way, but I think the biggest one has been the, the decision to keep our building closed for six months. This has been a, a crazy time, and there's all kinds of different opinions out there about what we ought to do as a church. But as I, along with our executive team and our elder board, have, have sought to make wise decisions about God's will for us, I gotta tell you, the single greatest concern for me has been the reputation of Christ. That, that, that I want us to make decisions that, that help protect any of you from getting sick, from being exposed to the virus. I want us to make decisions that, that help us to minimize the potential of the spread within our community. But my biggest concern has been the reputation of Christ. That, that I didn't want us to be a church that people looked at and said, they made hasty decisions. They made decisions that caused people to be exposed. They made decisions that, that had negative consequences for our community and that it diminished the reputation of Christ in the world. I wonder how much our lives in the world and our living in the world, our our, uh, reputation with the world would be different if we all had as our primary preoccupation the reputation of Christ. How might that change us? Paul says, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And when he says whatever there, I I think he means whatever, everything you do. Now, it seems to me that there really are only a couple of things that we really can't do for the glory of God. Of all the things we might do in the world, there are really only a couple of things that we can't do for the glory of God. The first is sin, (laughs) right? We, we, We can't 
sin for the glory of God. Try as we might, we can't say, God, I know this is wrong. God, I know this is not what you want for me. God, I know this is not what's best for me, but I'm doing it all for your glory, right? We, we can't do that. We can't sin for the glory of God. And that's why we struggle to find God's directive will for our lives when we know we're living outside the boundaries of his declared will for us, when we're making decisions that we know go against what God desires for us and what is in fact best for us. Because what God desires for us is always what's best for us. We can't sin for the glory of God. But do you know what's remarkable about God? That he can actually use your sin for his glory. We can never use our sin for the glory of God, but he can by forgiving you, by healing you, by transforming you. And that doesn't mean that we sin more so that God gets more glory, but that what is remarkable about God is that he can even take your sin and turn it for his own glory so that people recognize his character and beauty through the grace that he is always willing to lavish upon you. Maybe this morning you know that you've stepped across some boundaries in your life and you need to be reminded yet again that there is always grace, grace that forgives you, heals you, transforms you. You can't sin for the glory of God. And there's really one other thing that you can't do for the glory of God. And that is anything that you do for your own glory. That, that, that ultimately we have to wrestle with the question, is this for God's glory or is this for mine? And that as we seek to make decisions about which house do I buy, which job do I take, which person do I engage in a relationship with, is it ultimately about God's desire, God's will, God's glory, or is it ultimately about mine? You can't claim to be doing something for God's glory if in reality you're ultimately doing it for yourself. God's will is found in the recognition that my life is not ultimately about me. My decisions are not ultimately about me. And so we have to ask the motive question. Is this really about God? Or is this really about me? We have to wrestle with the motive question. But that leads us then second to the second kind of question that we have to ask and answer in order to find and follow the will of God, in order to know what that next step of obedience is. And that is the character question. The character question. Will this help me grow? We can ask the character question in a variety of different ways. Like, who is this going to make me? How is this going to form me? Who am I becoming? Or how will this make me more like Jesus? Paul writes the church in, in Thessalonica in, in Thessalonians chapter four, verse three. And Paul um, makes explicitly clear the will of God. We wrestle with the mystery of God's will. Paul says, I can tell you what it is. Here it is, you ready? This is the will of God, your sanctification. This word sanctification just means you're being made holy. You're being set apart from sin, set apart for God's purpose. And here in the context, as he's writing to the church in Thessalonica, he's applying that specifically to their sexuality. This is the will of God, your sanctification. That is, you abstain from sexual immorality. But the principle is true more broadly than that. God's will for your life is your sanctification. If you don't hear anything else that I say today, hear this. God's will is not so much about where you are going as it is about who you are becoming. God is so much more concerned about who you are becoming than he is about where you are going and what you are doing. 
It's not about where you're going. It's about who you're gonna be when you get there. Are you in fact becoming more like Jesus? And so as you wrestle with God's will for your life in a relationship, is does this relationship help me to become more like Jesus? Is this person becoming more like Jesus? And my relationship with them will help me to grow to become more like him. If you're wrestling with questions about how to spend your money, um, where to live, what to do with your life, You've got to ask and answer the character question. How will this form me? Who will I become? How will this help me to become more like Jesus? Last week, I introduced you to um, a quote from an author named Jerry Sitzer, who has a book called The Will of God as a Way of Life. And, And I think that right there in that title, there's an important lesson for us. The will of God really isn't just about these big decisions. It really is about a way of life. Here's the way that Sitzer puts it. He says, we think long and hard when we choose a college, a job, a career, or a spouse. And this makes good sense considering how consequential these choices are. But we give little thought to how much TV we watch or how often we talk on the phone or how seldom we praise our children. Yet, the little choices that we make every day often have a cumulative effect that far exceeds the significance of the big choices that we occasionally have to make. We are who we choose to become and how we choose to live every day creates a trajectory for everything else. Perhaps this is why the Bible says so little about God's will for tomorrow and so much about what we should do to fulfill his will today. God is far more concerned about who you are becoming than he is about where you're going, what you're doing. Now, this seems like an important time to offer a couple of, I think, really crucial reminders. And the first one of those is just a reminder that the will of God doesn't always look like what the world describes as success. That that sometimes what happens is that we think that that if I really am right there in the center of God's will, that that means everything for my life is sort of up and to the right, that everything will just lead to success. And that if I'm not experiencing that kind of blessing, that kind of success, then somehow I must be outside the will of God. This, friends, is, is not what we actually find on display in the pages of the scripture. It's not what we find when we look at the lives of the saints who have gone before us down through the centuries. This is a twisted version of the gospel rather than the gospel itself that reminds us that what is ultimately at issue is not success, but faithfulness. Mother Teresa of Calcutta has reminded us God calls us to fidelity and not to success. The litmus test of God's will is not success, it's faithfulness. It's the character of Christ being formed in us. And the second, I think, important reminder that we all need is that sometimes following the will of God requires us to take the hard path. That I think that we would like to think that really to follow after the will of God would, would, would be the path of ease. And yet, I think often even from our own experiences, we know that not to be the case. That sometimes following the will of God requires us to take the hard path. I was reminded of that truth this week in an email that I got from an IBCer named Joe Kennedy, a, a beloved member of our community. Joe was writing to me to, to let me know that, that um, my sermon last week really spoke to her heart about an issue that she's trying to submit herself to God's will in her life. But her email spoke to my heart as she recounted her story of 19 years ago when she was undergoing treatment for breast cancer. After three surgeries, she was trying to determine what's the next step to take. And, and in order to try to determine that, she consulted with three different doctors, all highly respected in their field. She went to the first doctor who told her, you don't need to do anything else. 
that after these three surgeries that, that, that you're good. She wisely consulted a second doctor who told her, well, I don't think you need any more surgery, but, but I think we will give you some chemotherapy just as insurance. She then went and consulted with a third doctor who told her, no, you need another surgery. And then depending on the results of that surgery, chemo and radiation and probably some more chemo. She called that third doctor, Dr. Hard. But she felt like God made it very, very clear to her that the next step of obedience and following his will was to follow the advice of Dr. Hard. And thankfully that she did because it saved her life. That, that he actually discovered that things were far worse than they had imagined. And that indeed she would need more treatment. And she writes about what she learned from that experience that I thought just needed to be shared with all of us because she says, praise God that I chose the road of obedience to him and submitted my will to his because he alone knew the right path for me and he made that very clear to me. And then here's the lesson for all of us. No one likes to deliberately choose the hard path. We selfishly want to take the easy road and hope that everything just works out. I say this to let you know that I have experienced the blessing of being totally submitted to God's will, no matter how hard it was. Sometimes the pursuit of God's will requires us to take the hard path, to choose the hard path. Now, I want to speak to some of you who are in the middle of some hard things in your life that you never would have chosen. That there wasn't for you perhaps a path in front of you, but you just find yourself feeling overwhelmed and, and burdened by all that's, that life is throwing at you in these days. That, that you don't even see a path going forward. That you, that you can't even anticipate what that next choice might be. I just want to encourage you that his presence is the plan. That he is there with you even in the midst of the hard. And just because it's hard doesn't mean you're not right in the center of God's will. And that maybe for you the prayer is, God, I don't like this. God, I don't understand this, but God, use this to make me more like Jesus. God's will for our lives has less to do with where we're going or what we're doing and so much more to do with who we are becoming. In order to take that next step of obedience, we need to ask the character question. Will this help me grow? Will this help me become more like Jesus? And then the final question, right? We begin with asking the, the motive question. God, is this about you or about me? We ask the character question. God, will this help me grow? Will this make me more like Jesus? And then third, we have to ask the service question. Will this help me to serve others? Is there one option that will help me to serve others more? In Galatians chapter five, Paul writes to this church in the region of Galatia and he says to them, you, my brothers and sisters, you are called to be free, but don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. We've talked before about this idea of the flesh. The flesh is the outlook oriented toward the self. When Paul uses flesh, he's not talking about our bodies as though our bodies are the problem. The problem is we live a life turned in on ourselves, preoccupied with ourselves, dependent upon ourselves. And Paul says, you were, you were made for freedom. You were given this incredible freedom in Christ. Don't use your freedom for the flesh, for the outlook oriented toward the self. 
Because life lived in the flesh will always lead to failure, to futility, to, to frustration. That it'll never lead to, to, to flourishing. God's desire for you is not to, to try to live your life oriented towards yourself, but to find that sense of fulfillment, to find that sense of flourishing precisely here. Serve one another humbly in love. The great 16th century reformer, Martin Luther, captured it this way. He says, for each one ought to live, to speak, to act, to hear, to suffer, and to die in love and service for another. Even for one's enemies, a husband for his wife and children, a wife for her husband, children for their parents, servants for their masters, masters for their servants, rulers for their subjects, and subjects for their rulers. So that one's hand, one's mouth, one's eye, one's foot, one's heart, one's desire is for others. These are Christian works. God says to us, all you are and all you have, I have given to you. But all you are and all you have, I have given to you for the sake of others. Part of the way in which we determine God's will for our lives, the way in which we determine the next steps from this direction or that direction, is how will this best position me to live my life and give my life in service to other people? If we really want to find and follow the will of God, we have to recognize that God's will is, is really not so much like a pathway to be found as a playing field with boundaries, living our lives with great sense of, of, of freedom within the boundaries of God's decreed will and God's declared will. That we submit ourselves to God, that we seek counsel from other people and that we take the next step of obedience that we know to take. But how do we determine what those next steps are? The motive question. God, is this really about you? Is this really about me? The character question. Which option before me helps me to become more like Jesus? Because God, your will is more about who I'm becoming than where I'm going or what I am doing. And finally, the motive question. Or, I'm sorry, the service question, how will this help me to serve other people? As we conclude this morning, I, I wanna just offer you a very simple prayer that you can pray, a prayer of relinquishment as you seek to truly submit yourselves and find and follow the will of God. And it simply goes like this. God, what you will, when you will, and as you will. God, do in my life what you will and when you will and as you will. For this is the way in which Jesus, our Savior, lived his life for us. And this is what it looks like for us to live our lives becoming more and more like him. Let's pray together. Father, I pray for the people who are watching, who are listening right now, some of whom find themselves in the midst of some circumstances that have them feeling confused and bewildered and not sure what that next step of obedience actually is in their lives. God, I pray that, that today that you would help them to submit themselves to you and, and to say to you, God, do what you will, when you will, and as you will. God, for those who find themselves uh, deeply desiring a sense of clarity in the decision that they're facing, God, that, that as a result of this time and this reflection, Lord, that you would help bring them to that place where they know what that next step of obedience is to take and that they would take it. And Father, there are those who are watching who they do know what that next step of obedience is, but they've been resistant Holy Spirit, would you move in their hearts so that they would, in fact, yield to you and take that next step?
And God, there are those who have crossed the boundaries that you have established for our lives. And I pray this morning they would hear you wooing them back, knowing that even though they have sinned and they have gone astray, that, that you ultimately can bring glory to yourself by forgiving them, healing them, transforming them. God, have your way in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.